Welcome to worship in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A couple of announcements. First of all, year-end contribution statements are in the back, along with giving envelopes. Please pick your statement up if, if you can today, before you leave. Second of all, next week is officer training for all elders and deacons right after worship. And we're, prob we're going to do this in the fellowship hall so that we can space apart and keep everybody safe and have lots of room. Uh, so please, elders and deacons, plan to attend next week from about 11.30 to about, uh, I know it said in the email, 3 o'clock. We'll see if it goes that long. <laughs> it may or may not go till 3. Um, but truthfully, you could come and go as you need to. So, um, what was the other thing? Oh, um, Pastor Carrie has returned from her mission trip and is going to be giving us a presentation next week. Is that right? Okay. All right. Um, so, we will be anxious to hear about the border ministries that are going on in Arizona slash Mexico um, next week. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Oh, oh sorry, Aaron. I knew there was something else. Good morning. So exciting news. This coming Wednesday, we are um, restarting our Wednesday night dinner and Bible study program. Um, we have two different studies that are going to be going on. Pastor Jim is going to be leading the adult study, and Pastor Kerry is going to be leading the youth study. Um, we are having dinner before those. So starting at um, 6.15, um, we will have dinner prepared each week by myself, uh, my sous chefs, Brian and um, Karen. Um, so please join us for dinner at 6.15 till 6.45, and then we're going to start Bible studies um, promptly after that. One of the biggest needs that we have is we need to know that you are coming so that I make sure that there is enough food for everybody. So I believe in the back of the uh, church, there is a sign-up sheet. So if you are planning on attending, please put down your name and how many people. Again, that way we can make sure that we have a, uh, an accurate amount of food. Um, there is a, a suggested donation for dinner for $5 a person or a $15, $15 family max. So uh, uh, help cover the cost of the food. So hope to see you on Wednesday. If you have any questions about it, feel free to see me after church or any member of the discipleship team, and they can give you some more information about the Bible studies. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, and do not be grieved. Lord 
is our strength. Please stand if you are able to sing our opening hymn, Christ, You Call Us All to Service. be seated. We greet one another as a sign of God's peace and Christ's friendship by saying, Christ's peace be with you, and we respond with, and also with you. Please extend the peace of Jesus Christ to each, to each other, however you feel most comfortable. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and remain with you all. Now the call to confession. Our patient God knows us all too well, knowing that change and challenge are difficult for us in this life. Let's open our hearts and silently confess our own weaknesses to God. Take a few moments to quickly speak to God in confession. Jesus has opened the doors for service to each one of us. We have been freed from our fears and doubts. Rejoice, dear friends. In Jesus' name, we are forgiven and healed. Amen. It's now time for Kids Rock. So Mr. Aaron and Miss Dawn will be taking you downstairs. This morning's prayer for illumination. Lord God of patience and persistence, even though these scriptures from Isaiah's scroll and Luke's gospel are not new to us gathered here for worship, open our minds and hearts to what you are calling us to be. Whether we have heard these words once or many times, help us to understand the mandate that can become a reality in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. This morning's Old Testament reading can be found in Isaiah chapter 61, 
We'll be reading verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. In my earlier ministry experience, I used to respond to hometown people asking why I cannot serve as pastor in my home church. I got asked that a lot. And I would jokingly answer that even Jesus was not welcome in his own hometown. Our passage today leads up to this rejection in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth and gives us this truth using Jesus' own words. But there is another more important message than just Jesus being rejected in his hometown for us and is clearly spoken by Jesus himself in the last verse of our reading this morning. Allow me to set up the context of this passage in Luke's Gospel today. Jesus' ministry has been on a roll up to now, up to this point, with several major events happening already. After his baptism by John the Baptist, his experience in the wilderness being tempted, and then Jesus sets out to proclaim God's love, the Gospel of love, And after preaching in Galilee, he travels to his own hometown of Nazareth. If you remember, his parents had fled Egypt, to Egypt, after his birth in Bethlehem to protect their son from King Herod. Well, then Joseph brought the family back to Nazareth after hearing about Herod's death. So Jesus really grew up learning his father's trade as a carpenter and first hearing the scriptures in the synagogues in Nazareth. And throughout these years, as scripture tells us, this son of Joseph grew in knowledge, in wisdom, and an understanding. So now Joseph's son returns to his hometown, knowing that what he will say to them will probably not be received very well by all the people. So let's read this together from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Hear God's word. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, And everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. May God bless our hearing of his word this day. 
Would you please pray with me? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. At this point, Jesus knew the books of the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. He was considered a traveling rabbi or a teacher. Since there were no permanent rabbis in the outlying villages in this area, any itinerant or traveling rabbi would immediately be welcomed in worship to speak and to read scripture. Whenever Jesus came to worship, which was his custom wherever he went, he was invited to read and reflect on it. The scroll that he was handed, as we read that day, was from the prophet Isaiah, which was our Old Testament reading today. Unrolling this scroll, Jesus reads exactly what we read today from Isaiah. Then wrapping the scroll up, he hands it to the attendant, and says these words. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And there's an important twist to those words that Jesus spoke for his audience and for us today. So let me try to illustrate this twist. This is supposedly a true story about a Franciscan monk in Australia who was assigned to be the guide and the gopher for Mother Teresa in her travels. When she visited New South Wales, he was thrilled and excited at the prospect of being so close to this great woman. He dreamed of how much he would learn by talking with her and what they would talk about. But during her visit, he became very frustrated quickly. Although he was constantly nearby and near her, he never had an opportunity to speak with her. He couldn't say one word to her because there were always other people around, other things for her to do. Finally, her tour was over and she was due to fly to New Guinea. In desperation, this Franciscan friar spoke to Mother Teresa. If I pay my own fare to New Guinea, can I sit next to you on the plane so we can talk and I can learn from you? Mother Teresa looked at him without hesitating and said, you have enough money to pay your own fare to New Guinea? Yes, he replied eagerly. Then give the money to the poor, she said. You will learn much more from that than anything I can say to you. Mother Teresa, you see, understood that Jesus's ministry was to the poor and she made it hers as well. You knew, she knew that they, more than anyone else, needed to hear the good news of the gospel. And it was her urgent responsibility to share that good news. On a Saturday morning in Nazareth, in the synagogue, the town gathered there to listen to Jesus read and to teach. And it was no big surprise. They all knew him, right? He was well known in that area. He had grown up there. He was raised there. They wanted to learn so much from him since he had been there. You can almost imagine some of the folks saying, I was his Sunday school teacher. I taught him. You should have seen him pick his nose in class. No. So when he read from the Isaiah scroll that he was handed, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Everyone understood those words to be about the, the prophet Isaiah. They were his words. It is how that prophet from long ago defined his ministry. When Jesus finished that reading, though, he hands the scroll to the attendant and he sits down. In that day, if you were a rabbi, or a speaker, you sat in what they called the Moses seat to begin your teaching or speaking. Today, preachers stand in a pulpit. So all eyes were on Jesus at this point. 
waiting for him to begin speaking. What would he say about this great prophet Isaiah? Would he emphasize the bad news that Israel had sinned and would be taken into captivity by the Babylonians? Or would he emphasize the good news that one day God would restore his people and bring them all the way back from captivity? It was Israel's ancient history, but it still spoke volumes to those people. Now here's the wonderful twist. The thing that catches everyone off guard that Saturday morning in Nazareth, and I suspect it catches us off guard also. Jesus mentions neither of the good news or the bad news from ancient history of Israel. He doesn't emphasize those things from the past. No, he focuses instead on the present. He doesn't lift up Isaiah as the great role model. He lifts himself up as the great role model. Right now, today. And this is the impertinent point. It's what upsets everyone at the synagogue eventually. It's why everybody was furious with him and would eventually drive him out of town and want to kill him. He dared to say these great words of Isaiah, and he said they were really about himself. Today, he says, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And Jesus was calling them and is calling us to fulfill those scriptures today, not tomorrow. Not whenever we have time, not whenever we feel like it, not if we're educated enough, not because someone else will do those things. Today, for us. In our scripture reading, Jesus' audience looks at him intently, amazed by these words, and then he drops that bombshell, telling them that God loves all people, Gentiles and Jews, we didn't read this far, but we will next week. Eventually, they become angry. And we'll hear next Sunday how they turned on him. This son of Joseph dares to tell them that God's love was for all people. They were thinking, we're the chosen people. It's not for the poor. I'm sure they were thinking that they are the chosen ones. Their lack of faith shows in a big way in this meeting in the synagogue. And Jesus has not come to his hometown to put on a show. That's not his goal. Turns out that the people he once knew best from his childhood lacked love, real love. And they just rejected the son of God's love. Jesus leaves Nazareth and never returns there again. Today, we know that the gospel of love was first preached to Jesus' own, own countrymen, his own neighbors, his own friends. When it was rejected, it was then presented to others. We also know that miracles were done where faith existed, right? Jesus' words were received by those with open hearts. God's love was demonstrated in word and confirmed in action by those faithful followers from then on. Finally, with Jesus' death, God's love confirmed that eternal love, which is the good news for all of us to share. And Jesus is calling us today, not tomorrow, this message of Jesus gets right at our expectations, doesn't it? What do we expect from him? What do we expect from God? What do they expect from us, Jesus and God? Expectations, that's a big word. It's a powerful word. Do you really think that we're going to get all that snow that's been predicted? Or... Have you heard about the frigid temperatures that are predicted? Is it really going to get that cold? Do you think they'll cancel school? Those are all the basis of expectations. And this time, 
you know, the expectation, the anticipation certainly didn't disappoint in my mind. Significant snow followed by extreme temperatures. We got it all and we're still getting it. I think to some degree, it's probably human nature that loves that kind of anticipation of what might happen. The expectation makes you sit on the edge of your seat, right? Expectations of things that could come about, that scares some people and it intrigues other people and draws other people in. It builds within us and it can affect all of the things that we do going forward and the actions we take, right, in everyday life. What are the expectations? Next week, we will talk more about this unexpected Jesus and what he has, the message he has for us. But it was no different in Nazareth. They had expectations. They knew this man. They knew that they heard that Jesus was coming ahead of time. They all had some expectations of him, specific expectations of him. But he didn't do or speak like they expected. With his words, Jesus undeniably claims to be none other than the promised Messiah. That's what he was saying. And what Isaiah foretold, Jesus was actually, in fact, doing. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism, indicating that this Jesus of Nazareth was appointed by God to do those things, to be those things. Last weekend, we heard how Jesus performed his first miracle at, in the wedding at Cana only to be followed by many others after that. Every miracle was evidence that Jesus was the Son of God and was God. That, in essence, is the good news that Jesus came to be and proclaim. To sinners who are spiritually poor, incapable of providing the perfect life that God requires them for heaven, Jesus has provided by his perfect life, lived in the place of every sinner, including us. This was unexpected news for them, and maybe it is for us. Although we intellectually know all this, we have the rest of the story, right? So we should, this should not be unexpected. And as if that was not a big enough surprise to the people in Nazareth, Jesus drops the bomb then and makes this good news personal for every person listening. Yes, Jesus ha had come to proclaim the message of forgiveness, literally the sending away of their sin and our sin, so that when God looks upon you and I, he no longer sees a person deserving of his punishment. Instead, the Lord looks on you and I with favor. Instead of being separated from him, he welcomes us into his kingdom and promises his protection, his peace, and his blessing forever. Yes, Jesus had come to proclaim the good news of forgiveness and the favor with the Lord for the poor. The poor sinners all of us. But the people in his hometown did not just hear it that way. They began to doubt quickly. How could good old Jesus be who he is claiming to be? Really? Jesus, the son of the carpenter, Joseph? He's just a son of a carpenter. Jesus had made it personal and just wasn't living up to their expectations. They were hoping that at the very least, Jesus could come back home and do some of those miraculous miracles that they'd heard about. Fancy miracles. Take away their problems. Make their lives easier. Bring them fame and fortune. Do we expect that? After all, didn't they deserve that? Do we deserve that? They knew Jesus. Jesus should be who they 
wanted him to be. He should do what they wanted him to do and not expect them to do anything differently in their lives. Do we think that? Friends, we are guilty of thinking those things and maybe doing those things sometimes. Do we ever try to turn Jesus into someone or something that we want him to be that's easier for us? Sometimes we turn Jesus into a magic genie, don't we? Who gives us whatever we desire. That's what we want. And come on, shouldn't Jesus only speak to me when I speak to him? I pray, I talk to him, that's when he should talk to me, no, none other, no other times. When I need to hear I'm loved or I'm forgiven, he better be there to assure me of those things. But when it comes to guiding my life, I don't need Jesus to tell me what to do or how to live. Stay in your lane, Jesus. Remember, you're just Joseph's son. Or maybe we prefer the vending machine, Jesus. Jesus, I want, to give, you want, to, I want you to give me this and this and this, but I don't like what you have to say about sacrifice, about suffering, about the way I should live, about sin. I'm going to pass on those things for right now, maybe tomorrow. After all, Jesus, I'm living through a worldwide pandemic. It's affected everything I do. My life is, is trouble enough and busy enough. Everything about my living has changed. I have enough problems and challenges to overcome without having to do anything for you today. Maybe tomorrow, when I get things under control, I'll begin to proclaim freedom for prisoners of sin. Maybe tomorrow I can help people to see you, to help them recover their sight from being blind. Whenever I have things under control, I can talk to others about the year of the Lord's favor for them. There is a story told of a guest preacher in a rather large church who began on Sunday like this. There are three points to my sermon. Most people went like this and yawned because they'd heard that many times before. They'd heard that lots about three, a three-point sermon, so, but he went on. He said, my first point is this. At this time, there are approximately two billion people starving in the world to death. The reaction was about the same. We've heard those kind of statistics many times before. And then he said, my second point, and then everyone sat up. He's already on his second point. It's only been 10 to 15 seconds. And he was already there. He paused and said, my second point is that most of you don't give a damn. He paused again as gasps and rumblings went through the congregation and then said, and my third point is that the real tragedy among Christians today is that many of you are now more concerned that I said damn than you are that I said two billion people are starving to death. And then he sat down. That whole sermon took less than a minute. But it is in many ways the most powerful sermon ever given. He was reminding us that we are called not to mere religiousness, faith, piety, even belief, but to genuine morality and action. We are called to action, not to fancy words. Jesus preached a short sermon in our passage, but what a sermon it was. He clearly denotes the kind of ministry he came to pursue. It is to be a ministry to the poor and the outcast, the blind and the unaffirmed. And then Jesus calls us to that model of living today, not tomorrow. Friends, Jesus is saying that to us today, not tomorrow. This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, not tomorrow, he's calling every one of us to spread this good news 
and model what he was sent to the earth to do. Amen. Please stand if you're able and let's state what we believe using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, before all worlds, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, we, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and became incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. Amen. Please be seated. Each week we have a prayer time that we call the prayers of the people. And that's really because it's a time to think about what all people, all of God's people, give to God. The joys, the concerns, the requests, the praise, the thankfulness. Whatever you're feeling and thinking this moment, this could go on and on and on for a long time if we stay here long enough because we all have lots of prayers that we can come up with and lots of concerns, lots of joys, but it's in this moment of what's on your hearts and minds. Crystal. Crystal. Thank you, Crystal. What was the name again? Matt? Matt. Matt. Why did I think it was Ed? I don't... Okay. <laughs> I knew there was an Ed there somewhere. Thank you. Anna Mary. Prayers for Jim and Olive and Roma. It's really tough being um, living in a facility like that. It's tough enough for all of us who can get out, but it's there's a different kind of stress that goes with living at Concordia or any facility like that. So they need our prayers. Anyone else? Michael. I called Mary Laura Gardner a couple times, and I haven't heard back from her, so I don't know if anybody has an update how she's doing. But, um, Several people have tried that, including myself, and haven't heard back. Yeah. So I don't know, we don't know whether she's traveling with family, she does that periodically, or whether she's just so sick she's not taking phone calls, and she's been very ill yeah. recently. We will lift up Mary Laura in prayer as well. Anyone else? Rebecca. Yeah. 
at Concordia? Um, if you send something to Concordia, just put her name on it and they'll get it to her, I'm sure. It's Concordia Seven Fields. Okay. And you can get that address online or I can give it to you. I have it downstairs. Anyone else? At the early service, we lifted up a friend of Bill Rankin's for knee replacement surgery, Al. And we also, Pastor Kerry lifted up at the early service, Oscar um, from the border, from her trip down to the border. Oscar is traveling back to El Salvador to be with his family, to be reunited with his family. So we prayed for his safety and safe travel and um, for God to bless that reuniting of, of family. And then we also prayed for Nancy Schaefer, who is having Mohs surgery uh, coming up on Tuesday. So prayers for healing and the surgeons to be guided and, and that surgery to go well. So let's go to the Lord with all of our prayers. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, listening to us, and answering us in your way and in your time. Lord God, help us to be strengthened, to be prepared, to be reminded of your calling to all of us, your call for us to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the poor, to the oppressed, to those who are sinners, all of those people around us who need your love and your eternal forgiveness and salvation. Help us to take action. Help us to take action today and not tomorrow. And help us to be the people that you want us to be today and not tomorrow. Lord God, you have heard lots of prayer requests, concerns, and joys this morning, and we would just lift up all of those joys and concerns, prayers for an upcoming knee replacement surgery, prayers for being reunited with family in a dangerous place, prayers for safe travel, prayers for a successful Mohs surgery, prayers for a successful surgery for uh, Matt, and prayers for those folks who are living in facilities all over the world. But in particular, in our church family, Roma and Jim and Olive. Prayers for Mary Laura as she recovers and uh, that everything is okay with her until we can make contact with her. Lord God, we lift up all of these people, all of these places, all of these circumstances to you and ask your blessing upon them. We know your presence will be with all of those people, and we know that, um, that your promised love will be surrounding them. We also know that uh, people are worshiping in churches all over the world today, whether it's on the street, on the sidewalk, in homes, in dangerous places, or in church buildings. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit to those places so that your name would be glorified and you would be lifted up in music, in scripture, in your word, in the preaching of your message. Be with all of them. Walk with them as they leave prepared to take action today and not tomorrow. Lord God, surround all of your church with your loving care and your strength and your peace today and not tomorrow, today and always. Lord God, we thank you for this, the gift of worship together. We thank you for the gift of your presence in our lives. We thank you most of all for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who is our model for today, for tomorrow, and for always. Help us to live as he lived. Help us to do as he did. Help us to be what he was and is for each of us. And we lift up all of our prayers today and in the coming days in the strong, his strong name who taught us to pray these words. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we share from what we have been given and from who we are as a sign of our desire to bring good news to the poor. May these gifts that we give bring light to all of those in need and put the joy of the Lord in their hearts so that all would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And Lord, and we ask that you give generously according to your own heart and your own faith to God's work because we are his hands and feet so that all would come to know him. So let me offer a prayer of dedication for all of our giving. Let us pray together. O oh God of all good gifts, we join with Jesus in proclaiming the year of your favor. Bless our gifts and bless us as we seek to bring joy and comfort to those who are unknown to us and to those who are near and dear to us. Use our gifts, multiply our gifts, and bless our gifts for your work and your ministries. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Please join me in singing our closing song, Christ for the World We Sing. where you go, where you are, where you find yourself. God has placed you there for a purpose. And Jesus Christ living inside of you will walk with you, prepare you, strengthen you for that purpose. So go with the love of God, the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the fellowship, guidance, and strength of the Holy Spirit today and every day. Amen.